fire is the most ferocious of natural disasters. This updraft, this massive updraft of flame and smoke, I mean, it must have been as close to hell on Earth as you could ever imagine. With temperatures soaring hundreds, even thousands of degrees. She was sure that, that this was the end of the world. And winds worse than any storm imaginable. It creates a tornado of fire. Wildfires in Minnesota have claimed more than a thousand lives. When Mother Nature fired up her weather engine, she really fired it up big time. It's just total oblivion. The deadly blazes are an important part of our past and our present. It became an international story and put Minnesota on the map, not really in the way that Minnesota wanted to be on the map. This is the story of Minnesota's fiercest fires. We begin here in Hinckley, considered the gateway to northern Minnesota, but it might be best known for a fire that ravaged the region back in 1894. Prior to the fire, this was a boom town. The mill was running two shifts a day. 400 men, 200 to a shift. They were putting out 200,000 board feet a day. So this was a colossal production. There were many bars, not as many churches. It was a rough and tumble town. Are the churches going to win or are the saloons going to win? That kind of thing. The casual wasn't usually single, male, young, with nothing to do but to drink. Inkley at that point was still the heart of the timbering industry. Well, maybe not the heart, but the foot of the timbering industry. Underfoot in the forest sat a quarter century worth of logging debris, perfect fuel to fire the flames to come. So many factors go into a, a major fire, and only two or three percent of all fires are classified as major fires, thank goodness. But you have to have a number of ingredients. You need usually a hot, dry summer. High temperatures, very high temperatures, 80s, uh, some 90s. In the fall. In the, uh, yeah, yeah, that late in the summer. I believe their rainfall deficiencies ranged from as much as six to nine inches below normal, which is very significant. Early September, 1894, all the big fires in the early days in the state were pretty much all fall fires. They had the summer to dry, you had a day of low humidity, you had a day of some wind. So it didn't take much to spark the Great Hinkley Fire. We believe that that one was sparks from a train. The second fire came from the south, about 12 miles. A man lit some logging debris and the wind picked up. It got away from him. And those two fires came together to form the firewall. But frontier blazes back then were common, at least small fires. So it may have taken some time for folks to absorb what was approaching. Settlers had to deal with so much, and they were fearful of blizzards and floods and tornadoes. But nothing could rival a major fire in terms of instilling terror. This updraft, this violent updraft equivalent to several Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons, is literally heating up and drying out the ground out in front of it. The winds got nothing but stronger the winds built up during the course of the fire. And of course, as with most major fires, as the fire grows in size, it generates its own weather. Those winds started to blow that day. They increased the flash of the fire, the rising of, of the flame. Now, eventually, it opens the clouds. Down comes the cold air. It creates a tornado of fire such an odd beast. The Great Hinkley Fire, we know, attained 4.5 miles in flame height. That's an incredible figure. You may not see the actual flames, but you might see the glow of those flames 
up in that smoke column, you know, from many, many miles away. There's intense heating, and there's probably some sort of shearing in the winds, but I, I, I couldn't imagine uh, what would unfold before one's eyes if they saw something like this coming at them. I saw it on video in a tornado formation. I've become semi-impressed when it rips full-grown pine trees out of the ground. <laughs> They manufacture their own twisting fire columns, their own twisting wind columns, and smoke, intense smoke. With the strength of those elements, they can jump vast distances. The temperature in this conflagration would have approached 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You have homes combusting spontaneously, people running for their lives. If they were lucky, maybe hopping on one of those railroad locomotives that may have triggered the fire to begin with. In Hinckley, people did run for the trains where some of the most dramatic tales from the fire unfold. As Root, the engineer, is coming toward Hinckley, he keeps thinking that the air is going to clear. Some people fell to their knees on the ground in the middle of the street. They're praying. They think it's the end of the world. He didn't reach Hinckley. He stopped one mile from Hinkley to the north, and people are running up the tracks. The town is on fire, save us. He has to go into reverse, as did the Eastern Minnesota Line. Both sets of trains on both sets of tracks ran on reverse because they couldn't get to the turntable to turn the engines around. The route is backing up. It's getting hotter and hotter. The throttle is metal, and his hand starts to burn onto the throttle. Twice we know at least, Root fell unconscious to the floor. Five miles back is a swampy place called Skunk Lake, and he's going to make a try for that. Then there are people like John Blair. John Blair was a black porter on the train, a man from St. Paul, a Minnesota hero. Everything's going to be all right, he told them, even though they can see the glass shattering. When the train finally stopped, he got off, he, he had to wet down the steps because the metal was so hot for them to get out of the train to get to Skunk Lake to the swamp. He went back again to make sure everybody was out of the train. Others who tried to get into the water were forced to face another fear. Mrs. Martinson runs with her children. They get into the water. They have to go where it's deeper. They can't swim. The sun is there. His sister says, save me. He couldn't, he was 12. After four hours of the sprinting flames, the coroner's report from that first day listed 418 dead. Many more succumbed to their injuries days, weeks, and months later. Mr. Martinson came back as soon as he can on one of the first uh, trains, and he, he found his wife and baby girls. They were buried in the mass grave, and as he walked away from the grave, there on the ground was a Bible, a big Swedish Bible with a big burn in it. I mean, it had to look like revelation. I mean, I'm, I'm sure many people thought it was the end of the world. Fires can move with terrific speed. They can move with speed that uh, would uh, overtake almost any of us, certainly. We can't move that fast. We're talking a fire in the Hinckley case of burning 300,000 acres, most of it occurring in one afternoon. It's just total oblivion. I mean, everything in its path. You could argue that the Hinkley Fire of 1894 was the weather headline of the year. The world heard about the horrible Holocaust in Hinkley, the awful aftermath in reporting that reached an international audience, and remains part of the state's conscience to this day. It became an international story and put Minnesota on the map. Not really in the way that Minnesota wanted to be on the map, because Minnesota didn't want to be on the map as a disaster area.
Now we continue to head north to the Cloquet Moose Lake area, where the worst natural disaster in state history hit in 1918. Well, it was very wooded. Actually, one of the main industries here was logging. It was the second year of extremely dry um, summer, hot, dry summer. The humidity, they said, was about 20%, which is very unusual for this area with all the lakes around here. The loggers would take basically the, the good timber and leave the brush. And so, of course, it would get very dry. It would be tinder. Before every major fire, you have a sudden drop in humidity. And you have all this fuel on the ground, you know, from the logging companies. October 12th, if I'm not mistaken, a little bit later in the fall, a little bigger population by 1918, a little more density in terms of numbers of people that were in danger. But with a world war on, there were global concerns and a stringent state stance. 1918 was a, a terrible year. We were in the midst of a war. Minnesota itself was in, under the control of a five men, men dictatorship, the Committee on, on Public Safety, uh, which prevented any kind of negative publicity about the state or anything else through its censorship process. So when the fire broke out, news coverage would not be as robust. The negative consequences of the fire were kind of diminished to some extent by the Public Safety Commission. But more importantly, there was also the, the, uh, the, the flu epidemic that, that took place at that time, and people were preoccupied with health concerns. So the fire, although disastrous, political liberties were under threat at that time. So, Look, a fire, what's a fire? It's a fire, I guess, that you know, personally means more to me because I know people who have gone through it. Both of my parents went through it. I grew up in northern Minnesota, a little store north of Cloquet, about 15 miles, called Burnett. That area was ran over by the fire in 1918. It wasn't just one fire again, it was multiple fires, multiple starts. And as the day went on, you know, many of these smaller fires merged into much larger fires. The railroads got blamed for a great deal of it, and they were steam driven and fired either with wood or coal, so there were sparks. But it was just, it was just a whole combination of things that, um, that started the fire. Of course, we call it the Moose Lake Fire, because, and we feel a little ownership because the greatest loss of life was from Moose Lake west of here. When it hit, the shores of Moose Lake, it actually jumped from treetop to treetop across the lake because of the wind. In the city of Moose Lake, many were able to seek refuge in the water and used their cars to try to outrun the wildfire. The smoke was so intense and so thick that they couldn't see. And there were like 26 deaths right at that particular corner because they just would run into each other. My mother-in-law's family were fire survivors, nine children and parents. And they lived about two and a half miles west of town. And as they were coming into town and coming down the hill, she thought, she learned in Sunday school that when the end of the world came, the stars would fall out of the sky. And she saw all the sparks and she was sure that, that this was the end of the world. You know, it was so traumatic. Um, she really never did talk about it at all, to me anyway, but she did write her story. A lot of people did take shelter in lakes. I do know three individuals that took shelter in a river and they were fortunate enough the fire passed over the top of them. Well, you know, it may not be in many cases the fact that the flames are killing an individual, but it would be, you know, the superheated gases uh, and the lack of oxygen that would be smothering people. One family, the mom and father put they're all their eight children in the root cellar and stayed outside throwing water on the wooden door to make sure that it wouldn't burn. Unfortunately, after the fire went by and they opened the door, all the children had suffocated because the fire took all the oxygen. 
Over 250,000 acres were burned. 35 towns were destroyed. 453 deaths occurred related specifically to the fire. And after the fire, another 106 people died. A horrific loss of life. Uh, many families lost. The intense heat to some depth, maybe down to six inches, sterilizes the soil. It kills every living organism in that top layer of the soil. The worst natural, natural disaster. disaster in Minnesota history. Yeah. yeah. Is it the worst natural I believe disaster? it is. An estimated 50 to 60,000 people were injured or displaced. I mean, can you imagine, you know, a similar tragedy today? I, we don't have anything that comes close to rivaling that. And I think people were shocked. I can't think of a better word that you could have that scale of a disaster. But all the ingredients converged again. It's thought that the railroads may have triggered as many as 50% of these fires. There was one for sure that was actually blamed on the railroad. There were many lawsuits that were filed. The government actually owned the railroads at the time, so there wasn't an entity that they could sue. It was like into the 30s before it was paid out. What do you think the impact is for the community? How do they remember this? We still honor those people. And part of it, I think, is we honor them for their perseverance to rebuild. And the Moose Lake Cloquet Fire may have stomped out the remnants of the logging industry and moved the region more towards mining. Uh, timbering, however, was petering out and was moving nationally towards the Pacific Northwest. At the same time, iron ore mining was becoming increasingly significant. Despite wartime censorship, papers did publish politicians' pledge of support. Charles Lindbergh, Sr., was running against uh, Governor Bernquist for the Republican uh, endorsement, uh, for nomination, actually. Politicians love disasters. I mean, look, no, they really don't, but they love it in terms, this gives them exposure. And for empathy and sympathy, each empathy and sympathy is votes 10 votes, five votes, 15 votes. Tremendous response, more so, I might add, than 1894 in terms of community and statewide response to recovery and rebuilding associated with that fire. It's no longer as in, shall we say, 19th century jargon, every man for himself. It's like the community response to the 1918 fire and recovery from it was uh, chapter one, maybe an example of how a community goes about recovering from such a tragic event. Our final stop takes us way up north to a series of blazes around the Boundary Waters canoe area that happened in this century. There's a whole chunk of land, water, that's really pristine, pure, clean, wonderful, northern Minnesota, southern Canada. Environmentalists and conservationists had their eye on that to preserve that. For that, we have to go back to Theodore Roosevelt. He starts a conservation movement, which was largely a very conservative movement. It's a movement really to conserve our natural resources. They started campaigning for that in the 1920s. In uh, 1978, the boundary waters were not determined by Minnesota politics. The boundary waters were determined by national politics by the uh, votes of, in Congress, and it did pass overwhelmingly, actually. Way back all the way to the 70s, the National Weather Service decided it needed to get quite serious about fire weather forecasting. And what they came up with was kind of an ingredients method for forecasting fire weather. First and foremost, it looks for dryness, dryness in the form of drought, Secondly, they look for daytime highs in the 80s and 90s 
but with extraordinarily low relative humidities. And then lastly, they look for a low pressure system. So two decades into its existence, the BWCA experiences a storm of the century. The July 4, 1999 blowdown done by maybe the most famous derecho, Spanish for straight line windstorm, to ever hit the state of Minnesota, cut a huge, wide swath of destruction. I mean, there may have been literally a million or more trees blown down by that windstorm. Just an unimaginable amount of, of fuel on the forest floor waiting for something to happen. I'm a lead forecaster at the Weather Service office in Chanaz, and that's my main job. Technology became advanced enough that we were able to deploy meteorologists or incident meteorologists, IMETs, on site. The big fires in Minnesota I've been on were um, started in 2006, you know, with the Cavity Lake fire. And that seemed like the granddaddy. That was 35,000 acres, roughly. There was a, a, a campaign that went on for multiple years after that 1999 storm to come in and try to help mitigate some of that by cleaning up and cleaning out certain areas, not leaving quite so much fuel. But it was so mammoth in scale that it ended up, in my view at least, kind of being piecemeal. What the um, Forest Service did, which is great foresight on their part is they did quite a number of large prescribed burns. Well, the Cavity Lake fire was largely a blowdown fire. Cavity Lake fire was started by a, a lightning strike. The big runs, the big runs are, are, are oftentimes one day or two days, but by the time you get a line drawn around that fire and you contain it and mop it up so that that fire isn't gonna cause any problems anymore, it, it takes a considerable amount of time to do that. It actually was the largest fire in Minnesota since the 1918 fire. Less than a year later, disaster strikes again. Suddenly in May of 2007, not quite in the same area, but awfully close, we're fighting another fire. It was totally different. So this was pretty unusual with how early it was. The ice had just gone off the lakes. That one is, uh, unfortunately got the human fingerprint on it, doesn't it? Yeah. And it was started by a, a campfire. 76,000 acres by the time a ham lake got done. It's a huge fire by modern times. There were a hundred structures that were burnt between the U.S. and the Canadian side. So the human impact of the ham lake fire is the biggest. But the BWCA blazes of the 2000s we're not done yet. Pagami fire um, started with a lightning strike, uh, 18th of August. The weather continued to get warmer, continued to get drier, fuels continued to get drier, and then the fire started making a push towards the southeast. I was called that evening, the 11th of September. Got up there the 12th, around noon, about the time it started making its 16 mile run. That was left to sort of a watch and see situation, which in the end I think most people feel was probably a mistake. Because when Mother Nature fired up her weather engine a bit later on, she really fired it up big time. That one really got out of hand and blew up. I mean, I think that's the proper word. It really blew up on people. In the modern context, when something like that happens, shame on you. I mean, you know, with the, with the way we fight fires these days, something like that shouldn't happen, but unfortunately, sometimes it does. 93,000 acres was the final tally, and about 60,000 of that was in one afternoon, for about five hours. So three major fires, you know, Cavity Lake, Ham Lake, and Pagami in a span of about five years. So it's been pretty incredible. We need to approach the North Woods with, with a renewed sense of humility and understand that in spite of all of our technology, all of our knowledge, 
we are going to have major fires. There's nothing we can do to prevent them. I know it's counterintuitive, but fire has a positive impact on the forest. It has a fertilizing effect. And in many cases, extreme heat releases seeds that go on to grow future trees, future shrubs, future flowers. Even beyond its regenerative effect, ultimately, fire teaches us all indelible life lessons. We're never going to eradicate fire. And on some level, we don't want to eradicate fire because it is part of nature. It's a little like trying to control tornadoes or control flooding. Good luck. You know, we can try to keep people out of harm's way. The more I study fire, the more humble I am as a meteorologist, how difficult it is to predict and how impossible it is to control. I mean, we are more than any other natural phenomenon. We are at the mercy of Mother Nature.